The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. This is Katherine Poole. I'm the president and founder of the Melanoma International Foundation. Our webinar tonight is about anti-PD-1. I know everyone, including myself, is very interested in knowing more about this promising therapy. So without further delay, I want to present to you uh, the anti-PD-1 pioneer, Dr. Mario Schnall. And he is a professor of medicine and medical oncology and co-director of the melanoma program at Yale Cancer Center. Now, don't forget to stay tuned for the questions at the end of uh, Dr. Schnall's presentation. And now I want to welcome Dr. Schnall. Um, uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I, I, uh, um, the, um, um, I'm going to see if I can. It works. Works. So, uh, thank you for that introduction. I, I'm actually not the anti-PD-1 pioneer. I, I just, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate clinicians who's been able to participate in the, in the clinical trials, uh, in the early clinical studies. Uh, the people who actually discovered uh, this pathway uh, uh, are uh, basic scientists like Li Ping Cheng and uh, Gordon Freeman, uh, and uh, it was their work that really made it possible to develop this drug. And also, the scientists at Matterex. Uh, people like Alan Corman who helped bring this to uh, uh, clinical trials. Um, so we've been involved with these clinical studies for, for um, now almost three years. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a little bit of background, very basic immunology, before we talk about the clinical data. Because I think it's important for people, especially patients who, who don't really think about this very often, to get an idea about the biology that, 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 that underlies the, uh, uh, the use of this drug. So in this first slide, um, it's important to understand that cancer cells have antigens. These are things that are recognized by the immune system. And the things that the immune system recognizes are either mutations in proteins, which are very common in cancer cells, or proteins which may be expressed during development, in fetal development. Then they're not expressed in the, in the adult, but they're re-expressed in cancer cells. So those can be recognized as cancer-specific antigens. And then tissue differentiation proteins. So these are things that might be expressed in melanocytes, the cells that ultimately go on to form melanoma, your normal pigmented cells. But they're not really uh, expressed in other tissues. That's why when you develop an immune response against melanoma, your immune system can attack your, your normal melanocytes. You develop vitiligo, for example, whitening of the skin. But you don't develop other tissue toxicity, although there are melanocytes in other tissues, such as the eyes, for example. And so if you develop a strong anti-melanoma response, you can also develop, for example, a uveitis or an inflammation of the uh, back of the eye. Those cancer cell antigens are actually presented to the, to the T cells, which are the lymphocytes in the, immune, the part of the immune system that recognize the tumor cells through a very special kind of cell called a dendritic cell. <clears throat> Those dendritic cells actually process these uh, proteins, these cancer cell antigens, to small fragments. Uh, they put them on the surface of the cell, and then they present them to the T cell together with a bunch of other signals, positive and negative signals, which actually lead to T cell activation. T cells are lymphocytes. They're activated, and then when those T cells are activated um, and, uh, and recognize a specific antigen, they travel throughout the body. They go and find tumor. And when they find the tumor, they can either kill the cells directly or they secrete hormones within that tumor microenvironment, which creates an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response can do one of two things. Sometimes it can actually aid the growth of tumor, but often it'll cause the tumor to uh, become sick and die. Um, so let's see. I'm having problems. There we go. So the, um, the, it, it's important to understand, again, that it, there's, there's a lot of signals that control immune activation. And those signals include that, that sort of specific signal to the T cell, which is the antigen uh, within a, what's called an MHC molecule that binds to a receptor on the T cell. And that, that's sort of a lock and key. That's a very specific interaction. Each T cell has a different kind of receptor. Uh, which can recognize a different antigen. That provides a specificity of the immune response. But then there are hormones, cytokines, hormones, which can bind to receptors on the T cells, which can cause them to 
proliferate or function better and also in some cases decrease their function. And then there are at the time of the T cell is activated, that actually occurs with a T cell face-to-face uh, -face with an antigen-presenting cell. And not only does it receive that lock and key signal through the T cell receptor, but there are other lock and key interactions. Um, ligands, they're called, that bind to receptors on T cells, some of which provide more positive signals that help the T cell to proliferate or activate, but other signals that actually turn off that T cell or block T cell proliferation. Um, and this whole business of the immune activation is a yin-yang. There are on and off signals. And so we can manipulate the, the immune system by either providing positive signals or another way is by blocking the off signals, turning off the off signals, which allows the T cells to work better. So one more thing that I just want to go over is some basic assumptions that we have regarding the use of an agent like anti-PD-1. One is that when the cancer is discovered, it's probably been growing in the body for a very long time. And as the cancer grows and spreads, the cancer cells not only are growing and dividing, but some of them are also dying. And in that process of, of dying, they are taken up by antigen-presenting cells, and they activate the immune system. Cancer cells have many abnormalities, many mutations, or other antigens that can be recognized by the immune system. And so many of us feel that many patients with cancer, possibly most patients with cancer, have generated an immune response against their cancer over time. Uh, the problem is, or one problem is, is that cancer cells have found ways to damp down this immune response or to block what I call the full expansion and the effectiveness of the anti-cancer immune response. They provide negative signals to the immune system. And if we can block those negative signals, we can, we can uh, uh, basically re-energize the immune system to attack the cancer cells. Oops, I keep going after that. Oh, the, the return button works. So the, the things that we use to manipulate anti-cancer immune responses and the things that you've heard about are cancer vaccines. Those are, so we try and take the antigens from the tumor and present them in a special way to activate the immune system better. Or cytokines, which we've talked about before, and you've heard about interleukin-2 and interferon alpha. They're used to treat cancer. These are nonspecific ways of providing positive signals to T cells. Or the immune modulating antibodies. These are antibodies which bind to the surface of the T cells, but bind to the receptors that produce positive or negative signals. And some of the antibodies will transmit a positive signal into the T cell through specific receptors, and some will block negative signals. Anti-PD-1 is in the category of antibodies that blocks a negative signal. And by the way, so is anti-CTLA-4 or ipilimumab, which has just been approved by the FDA. But those two agents block negative signals in different ways, or they block different negative signals. And then the last, which I think many of you have heard, is uh, uh, our cell therapies. And this is a way of taking antigen-specific T cells or tumor-specific T cells out of the, into outside of the body, expanding them outside of the body, and then giving them back to patients in very large numbers in order to uh, affect an, an anti-cancer immune response. And TIL cells are an example. Many of you have heard of the work that Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Hu and Dr. Yi and Dr. Weber and others are doing around the world uh, to try and develop these cell therapies for patients with melanoma and other cancers. Um, there we go. Um, so just one of the last background slides here are this, this interface between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. And you can see all of these positive and negative signals. And you can see in red, the second red box is PD-1, which transmits a negative signal to the T cell. Now the ligand for that, the thing that binds to PD-1, it's called B7H1 or PD ligand 1. There's actually a second ligand, but we're going to focus on the first one, which is B7H1. When that ligand binds to PD1, it, it, it turns off, doesn't completely turn off, but, but slows down or damps the function, dampens down the function of that T cell. Now, that ligand can be expressed on antigen presenting cell, but it's important to understand it can also be expressed by tumors, by cancers. So this is a way that cancers can turn off or turn down 
T cell responses, those T cells that infiltrate the tumor to try and attack the tumor. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. So why is PD-1 important? So PD-1 expression on T cells goes up when the T cells are activated. When PD-1 binds to its ligand, to that sort of key, um, PD-1 then transmits a negative signal to the lymphocyte, to the lymphocyte where it's expressed, reducing its function. This ligand for PD-1 is often expressed by tumor cells. Um, and the tumor cells can express even more PD-1 when T cells go in, because when T cells go into the tumor, they produce cytokines. And those cytokines that they produce, which are meant to try and kill the tumor cell, can also cause increased expression of the PD-1 ligand, or B7H1, which in turn binds to PD-1 and turns off the T cell. So it's a negative regulatory feedback mechanism. We believe that this is an important mechanism for tumors to block the anti-cancer function of invading lymphocytes. And blockade of PD-1, at least in the way we think that it works, is probably most important within the tumor microenvironment itself. And it's possibly, I consider it probably more specific and different than the kind of blockade that you get with CTLA-4, with ipilimumab or Yervoy. That that blockade is sort of more non, a more nonspecific way of turning on the immune system, and it probably occurs outside of the tumor in lymph nodes where T cells are usually activated. When you block PD-1, you're reactivating T cells probably within the tumor microenvironment. And so what that would predict is that you would probably get less nonspecific immune stimulation of the PD-1 blockade. But it's also possible that if you have an inflamed normal tissue, that if you block PD-1, you may get more damage in that inflamed normal tissue. So it predicts for perhaps uh, maybe not a different spectrum of side effects than, than ipilimumab, but perhaps a different intensity or quality than ipilimumab. Um, so um, this is one slide. This is just a preclinical slide. And it, I'm, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it just goes to show this was data published by Li Ping Cheng and Dong et al. in Nature Medicine. This is a, the paper that actually got me interested in this, in this drug, showing that uh, if you see this curve here, this is a tumor in which a very strong inflammatory signal, B71, has been placed into the tumor. This is what happens to the tumor with no inflammatory signal. This is what happens to the tumor with the B71 inflammatory signal. And when you put both the inflammatory signal, B71, and B7H1, which is the ligand for PD-1, the, the, the ligand for PD-1 overcomes this positive effect of inflammation and allows the tumor to grow out. So this negative effect of B7H1, which is a ligand for PD-1, overcomes the very strong inflammatory influence of the B7-1. And it turns out that in this initial paper, most human melanomas actually express B7H1, and many of them expressed it at a fairly high level of intensity. So um, this is just a slide from Dr. Li Ping Cheng, who recently came to Yale. and is one of the, the really uh, discoverers of this pathway, one of the key people who developed the science for this pathway showing that within a tumor, when you have T cells, and this is the red stain here, if you look over here in the same area of the tumor, you have very high level expression of, of the B7H1, or the ligand for PD-1. So this goes to show when T cells come in, the ligand, the thing that turns off the T cells, is also very highly expressed within the same vicinity in the tumor. And this shows that, um, and this is just a preclinical slide showing that uh, also from Dr. Li Ping Cheng, that melanoma tumors by themselves won't express the ligand for PD-1, but when they're exposed to cytokines, they upregulate it in a remarkable way here. So we're going to very briefly discuss the available clinical data. I've given you the background for why we think anti-PD-1 is important and why we think it should be active. Uh, MDX-1106 was a drug created initially by Metarex. I think many of you know that Metarex was bought by Bristol-Myers, so now it has a BMS number. And it was developed in collaboration with a Japanese company called Ono. Uh, the fact that it's a human IgG4 just means that it's an antibody which by itself doesn't, doesn't uh, have any effector functions, or much in the way of effector functions. It doesn't mediate killing of tumor cells or, or, or lymphocytes directly. Um, 
It binds with very high affinity to PD-1, so it blocks the PD-1 binding to its ligand uh, very effectively. There was an initial phase one study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology about a year ago from Julie Brammer, um, who's at Hopkins. Uh, she worked very closely with Suzanne Tupalian there. This was a study which is at standards, dose escalation, initial first in man study. There were multiple tumor types. They were limited to five tumor types in this trial, but all of these kinds of patients were enrolled. In this study, you were only allowed to give a single dose, and then you had to wait several weeks before you could give another dose. So this wasn't the, uh, a, the standard uh, uh, treatment for cancer patients in which the drug is given repeatedly every few weeks. Um, but even with this limited uh, exposure to drug, um, it, it was very well tolerated. Uh, there were very few serious adverse events. And the, the adverse events that were seen were very mild, mostly rash. Um, uh, Oops, uh, I did something here with my computer. Rash, fatigue, arthralgia, myalgias, and a little bit of lymphopenia, none of these which were terribly clinically uh, significant. Um, the activity of the drug in this just very small sample size with limited dosing already uh, demonstrated one partial response. Partial response means approximately a 50% reduction in the volume of tumor at the highest dose level that was studied. And this PR was ongoing at 22 plus months when the paper was published, and another mixed response in melanoma. So two out of the 10 patients with melanoma in this initial study showed some evidence of activity. Um, this is a drug that hangs around for a long time, like all antibodies. So when you give it, it's in your body for uh, quite a long time. And as it turns out, the, the receptor that it binds to, once you give the drug at a single dose, it can, it can occupy that receptor for months at a time. So the, the next study that was done was one in which the, we decided to give, the company decided to give the drug every two weeks. And the drug is given every two weeks for two years or until someone, uh, d their disease progresses or until they've had a complete response of all their tumor. At the end of two years in this trial, it was mandated that treatment stop at two years, regardless of the response at that point. And there were five kinds of tumors that were uh, enrolled on that study. But for melanoma, they, uh, they allowed expansion at three different dose levels, at one milligram, three milligrams, and 10 milligrams per kilogram. And 10 milligrams per kilogram was the highest planned dose in that trial. These were, the, this is the latest data that's available this was presented at, uh, at an ASCO meeting primarily for GU malignancies in, in, 2000, in January of 2011. And at that time, uh, 126 patients had been enrolled in that study, of which 56 patients had uh, metastatic melanoma. Uh, you can see, and this is true for the metastatic melanoma patients, uh, although it's not broken down here specifically for melanoma, most patients had, had multiple prior treatments. You can see that quite a number of patients had what we call an ECOG performance status one means that you're not feeling completely well. You're able to do your normal activities, but you're not completely well. And performance status two means that you have to spend about 50% of your time in bed during the day. You're, you're having a lot of symptoms from your disease. Um, I don't know the, the sex breaks down for male, female, but I would imagine in melanoma, it was probably more even than this would indicate here. So in terms of side effects of anti-PD-1, and I, I haven't presented the, the full data, but I just want people to understand that we, we dose patients up to 10 milligrams per kilogram every other week. It was very well tolerated. It wasn't clear that the toxicities at 1, 3, or 10 milligrams per kilogram were any different. It looked to be about the same uh, incidence and intensity of side effects. And overall, for all of us, our, our impression was that it was a very mild side effect profile. You could induce some of the same toxicities as ipilimumab, but the incidence of those toxicities appeared to be much lower and the severity substantially less. So most of the, the toxicities included a few lab test abnormalities. Um, you could have rare effects on the endocrine glands, which you can see with ipilimumab um, on the thyroid, pituitary, or the adrenal, but these were relatively rare. There was a rare incidence of colitis 
a few patients develop shortness of breath and some pulmonary infiltrates. Um, and then uh, just as you saw in the phase one study, the single dose study, uh, a few patients develop mild rash, um, very mild fatigue, uh, a couple of patients develop mouth soreness, and a few patients develop joint aches. But overall, this is one of the best tolerated drugs that I've ever given in a uh, phase one trial. And many of our patients had no side effects at all. Um, and this is the clinical activity that was reported at ASCO in 2010. We don't have an update at this point, but of the 46 patients that were treated with melanoma, at least 15 had partial responses. And we know that perhaps one or two of these patients have gone on to a complete response, meaning all their disease has completely uh, gone away on CT scans. There were a number of other patients who did not meet criteria for PR. To meet the criteria for partial response, you have to have approximately 50% of your tumor volume reduced in size. But there were other patients who didn't meet that criteria who appeared to be responding to the drug. They had less than, than, than that reduction of tumor volume. Um, or they had a mixed response, meaning some lesions got bigger, some got smaller, but overall may have had um, um, uh, improvements in uh, some benefit from the uh, from the drug. We can't estimate, and I can't estimate for you how many of those other patients there were, but even 15 out of 46, which is approximately a 33 percent response rate, is very impressive for a phase one trial. Could you give me the oh, There it is. And as of May of 2010, every one of those partial responses <clears throat> Uh, had not uh, progressed at the time of the presentation. And this, this uh, uh, time calculation is from time on study. Now, in the subsequent year, between May of 2010 and subsequently, in that subsequent year, some of these patients have developed disease progression, but many of these patients are still responding. Their, their disease has not progressed. They've continued to respond to the drug. In some cases, people have met the, have, uh, completed the two years of treatment, have gone off treatment, and we're continuing to follow them, follow them, and they have not had any disease progression. <clears throat> this is an example of one of our patients who had an excellent response in, in lung lesions and in a very large liver lesion. And you can see here that this very large liver lesion is now reduced in size. This was only about six or seven months after starting treatment. This lesion here is now further reduced in size, although it's not gone completely away, and that patient uh, completed treatment at two years and has been followed for another 10 or 11 months without any evidence of any disease progression. We also performed a PET scan on this patient, even when they had tumor about this size, and the PET scan at that point in time showed no evidence of any uptake, suggesting perhaps that this, there's no active tumor within this uh, lesion. <clears throat> See if we can get to another. Uh, the next slide, please. Doesn't seem to be advancing. Oops, go back one, please. Um, so this is another example of uh, a patient also um, that we treated here at Yale who had previously received high dose interleukin two and had disease progression and adrenal metastasis. So although I show here at the time of this uh, uh, film only a partial response. Uh, this patient eventually went on to develop a complete response of treat to uh, her treatment, um, has not been treated for the past year, and has had no evidence of disease progression. And this is an example of another type of response that we see, which is a mixed response. And this patient had enormous disease in the liver, was very sick, um, not so sick that she couldn't go on study, but, but very sick, had clear tumor regression, but it was a mixed response. Some lesions got better, some did not. And ultimately, after a period of approximately, uh, as I recall, around seven months, her disease did progress and she needed to go on to other treatments. However, given the kind of disease that she had on study, I would guess, based on just uh, uh, observation, that she derived some benefit from this drug and may have lived longer because she received this drug. So this is a slide comparing the three different immunotherapy treatments that we have available, excluding 
uh, cancer vaccines and cell therapies. And you can see here that objective response rates, which don't always correlate to the potential benefit of the drug, are different between interleukin-2, which is about 15 percent, anti-CTLA-4, which is in the range of 10 to 15 percent. And in this very small sample size for anti-PD-1, 46 patients at the time of presentation, a 33 percent response rate. Now, whether that response rate will hold up when we treat more patients is unclear, although I'm very optimistic that it will. And these are perhaps non-overlapping subsets. So uh, for if you've had previous interleukin-2, you can respond to uh, anti-CTLA-4, uh, even if your disease did not respond to interleukin-2. We know for certain that if you've had prior interleukin-2 and did not respond, you can certainly respond to anti-PD-1. What's not known today is if you've had anti-CTLA-4 or anti-PD-1, whether you can then respond to interleukin-2. And we also don't know, because these patients were not allowed to be enrolled on the trial, if you've had prior anti-CTLA-4 and if you've not responded, whether you could respond to anti-PD-1. My guess is, is that a some subset of those patients will respond to anti-PD-1, even though they could not respond to anti-CTLA-4. And then the other sequence, which is giving anti-PD-1 first, followed by anti-CTLA-4, there are at least one or two anecdotal uh, cases uh, one in our hands and, and at least one or two at other centers in which the disease did not completely respond to anti-PD-1 or ultimately progress, and then those patients went on to get anti-CTLA-4 and had a good response to anti-CTLA-4. So these are the, the, the PD-1 uh, or PD-1 ligand blockade agents that are in development. So I've talked to you about MDX-1106. But Bristol-Myers has a, an antibody that blocks the other side of this, the PD ligand one, which is in clinical trials and probably is also active in melanoma, although we don't have any of those data. CureTech, which is a small company in Israel, has an antibody which uh, is believed to block anti-PD-1, and they're going to begin studies in melanoma. Merck has a phase one trial ongoing uh, of an anti-PD-1 agent. Genentech is rumored to have an anti-PD ligand 1 agent that they will develop. And Amplimune, which is a small company partnered with GSK, has an agent which uh, effectively would block uh, uh, PD-1. It's actually a PD ligand 2 FC fusion protein. It may work a little bit differently than the antibodies that block PD-1, but, but conceptually the same, uh, the same approach. Now, the current clinical development of MDX-1106 in melanoma, these are the studies that, that we know that are ongoing. The, the current version of the phase one trial, giving the anti-PD-1 uh, every other week, is nearly complete. And uh, it's evaluated two additional doses of lower doses of 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 because uh, the company was interested in knowing what the uh, minimal effective dose might be. Obviously. Um, one never knows if one will see toxicity with higher doses and if one can find the minimal dose that provides the same level of activity that could provide an advantage in many different ways, drug production, and also reducing the potential for toxicity. So it's an important question. Um, there are two phase one trials in combination with vaccines being conducted at um, uh, the, uh, the Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Jeff Weber is the principal investigator. And there's a phase one study in combination with ipilimumab that's being conducted at our center together with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, I don't know what additional development Bristol has planned for anti-PD-1 in melanoma, although I, I know that they are committed to development of the agent in that disease. So these are the other potentially important PD-1 blockade trials that we might guess would be done in the future. Um, it's certainly of some interest to know what uh, anti-PD-1 does in patients who don't respond to ipilimumab. This could conceivably be a registration study because there's nothing for uh, patients that we know that works after ipilimumab, um, uh, particularly if they don't have BRAF mutations, for example. And in the context of that trial, we may try and develop biomarkers, for example, to find out if B7H1, which is a ligand for PD-1, if expression of that in the tumor is correlated with response to anti-PD-1. We certainly would like to know what anti-PD-1 does 
before ipilimumab. We already have some data from the current trial, but that, that sort of information needs to be expanded substantially. There are a large number of combinations which are of substantial interest. For example, with the BRAF inhibitors, which are known to cause infiltration of T cells into tumor, with ipilimumab that I spoke to you about before. And there's a lot of data that I showed you at the beginning of this presentation to suggest that an agent like interferon alpha, which actually upregulates the ligand for PD-1 in tumors, that that might be synergistic together with anti-PD-1. And then, of course, in the cell therapy trials, we give cells. Those cells, when they're activated, upregulate PD-1. So you might imagine that giving anti-PD-1 together with cell therapy might provide an additional therapeutic effect. And eventually, because anti-PD-1 is so well tolerated, and because it's produced such a high rate of response, we would want to look at it in patients who are at high risk for occurrence, for example, after their primary is resected, but have not yet developed metastatic disease. And that would happen in the future, hopefully uh, uh, not too long from now. So in summary, PD-1 blockade is, is possibly one, well, I believe it's one of the most promising approaches for the treatment of melanoma. So far, in a small sample set, the objective response rates have been in the 30% range. Many of the responses, we believe, are durable, but the follow-up so far is limited. It hasn't been in clinical trials for a long time. We don't yet have a biomarker proven to select the 33% or the 30% of patients that might respond. We don't know what it does after ipilimumab, and we'd like to know that. And we think that there are many very important combinations of this drug which could lead to better outcomes for uh, patients. And I think that's the last of my slides, and I'm happy to take questions if any of you have questions. Well, I have quite a collection of questions for you, and thank you for that really great presentation. Um, I'm really excited about this drug, and others are as well. So um, how many patients would you say have been treated so far with the um, anti-PD-1? Well, the... Um you mean with, in, with melanoma? So, yes, in, in total. Could you well, I mean, there were, as you saw, there were 56 patients when it was presented at ASCO GU. Mm -hmm. And then the expansion cohorts um, were 16 patients apiece. So, you know, 56 plus 48, uh, it'll be in that range. About 100? Maybe about 100, yeah, right. Okay. Maybe a few more, but I mean, it's, it's not much more than that. And I think you answered this already, but um, whether they were treatment naive or they'd all endured first-line treatments with something they like all They all had to have a first-line treatment. Okay. So we've never seen what it does with um, treatment naive patients? Uh, no. That's correct. I, I'm really um, excited when you mentioned about, you know, possibly a stage 3 adjuvant therapy, that would be wonderful if we don't have anything that's, you know, that would be less toxic as that. Well, point. yeah, I mean, ipilimumab may be very effective in that setting, but it does have toxicities, and anti-PD-1 right. might be a good alternative, but I think right. it'll be a while before we see the adjuvant trial, because usually, you know, the drug is fairly far along in registration in a mm -hmm. metastatic disease setting before companies begin adjuvant studies. Right, and, and the adjuvant studies are pretty hard to to figure out, um, you know, whether if there's no evidence of disease, it's very hard to figure if the agent's working or not. Well, you have to do a randomized, large randomized study, right. and, and it would be compared to interferon, which is a standard in the U.S., or if it turns out that ipilimumab is better than interferon, then it could be compared to ipilimumab, or it might be a combination of ipilimumab and anti-PD-1 versus ipilimumab alone, so there's a number of different ways. Or you could compare anti-P1 plus interferon versus interferon. But those, those kinds of trials to show the uh, effectiveness and the safety of those combinations are, aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope they come soon. Uh, well, um, <laughs> well, right now I feel like our, our stage three people are, are really pretty well stuck. Um, how do you view the response rates in general? You, you went into a little bit of um, complete responses and partial responses. The partial responses were a 50% reduction in tumor. Well, it depends on how you define partial responses. If you use RESIST criteria, it's 
at least 30% reduction in the sum of the unidimensional uh, uh, diameters. But, but, but in general, a partial response translates to an approximate 50% reduction in tumor volume. That's the way we usually view it. So um, it's a standard that's been used for many years in medical oncology. Uh, it doesn't mean that something that's less than a partial response isn't meaningful. If you have a 30% reduction of tumor volume and it lasts for a long time, that could be a really, a really meaningful benefit, for example. Especially so it's an arbitrary cutoff. Right, and especially in melanoma where, you know, we get pretty dismal responses with a lot of other agents. Yeah. It's, it's also the case, by the way, that with these biological agents, immunotherapy agents, a mixed response can provide some benefit. So with ipilimumab, we know that there are patients who will have much of their tumors go away, and then one or two will grow, and then we take out those tumors or treat the growing tumors with radiation therapy, and then we follow those patients for a very long time, and they don't have any additional disease progression. So even a mixed response with some of these immunotherapy agents can, in some patients, possibly produce benefit. Benefit meaning they may live longer because they, they've received the drug. The only way we can actually prove that people live longer is, unfortunately, by doing a randomized clinical trial. Right. Um, <clears throat> so for long-term duration of response, I believe I saw on the slide 15 months. Would that be the longest we've seen? Well, um, no. It's, it's probably uh, uh, close to at least three years at this point for some patients. And that's an NED status? With well, it may not necessarily be NED. It means progression-free. It means that they, okay. They've responded to the drug. Maybe all their disease hasn't gone away on CAT scans, but their disease also hasn't progressed over that period of time. And have you seen um, any interesting patterns of response um, among, like, BRAF status or HLA? I know that Weber is using HLA-positive folks only in his trial. Is there any you know, sort of... You know, with ipilimumab, there's no correlation between HLA status and response, and I don't believe that'll be the case for anti-PD-1 either. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't believe that there will be a correlation between um, uh, BRAF mutation status and response to ipilimumab, and probably that will, that'll be the case with anti-PD-1 also. So for, for these biological agents, I don't think that they care whether somebody has a BRAF mutation or not or what their HLA phenotype is. Mm -hmm. um, now, that may be important when you do combinations, obviously, because if you're going to combine with a BRAF inhibitor, you're going to want to treat a patient who has a BRAF mutation. Right. But, but in terms of whether there's one group that responds better or worse, we don't know that, and my, my suspicion is, is that there won't be any difference. Would we be able to derive that from Weber's studies? or? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not, I mean, you know, Jeff may be looking at it, but you have to treat a lot of patients to know that there really isn't a difference. You know, there could be a subtle difference, but you'd only detect that after looking at large databases. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll know that right away. But certainly, no one out there should select on the basis for treatment, should select on the basis of HLA type or BRAF mutation. Any patient would be a good candidate for these drugs. Right. The only time they would need to do that is if they were combining it with something. That's correct. Um, what about marker behaviors, such as absolute lymphocyte count? Not known. Not known. No. And um, one question everybody asked is, you know, have there been delay delayed responses, like IPI, where, you know, there's maybe progression and then regression over time? Um, yeah, you, you can see that. I don't think that it's... Um, um, uh, we, we, we've observed, maybe at the eight-week time point, some things that have grown and then gone on to regress. Um, we've certainly seen mixed responses. Some things regress and some things continue to grow. Um, but, uh, you know, my impression of this drug is that, you know, the people that are really going to do well, I, I think a lot of them we see something good happening at eight weeks. Now, it may take a long time for that response to evolve. You know, may not may not, they're not going to achieve their best response at eight weeks. Those lesions may shrink slowly over time. 
but but I don't think un, unlike ipilimumab where you really sort of at 12 weeks can just really see marked progression and then at 16 or 18 weeks start to see regression that pattern may be seen with anti PD1 but I don't think it's going to be quite as uh, common or prominent it's not very common with ipilimumab either for that matter hmm. You do see it with ipilimumab. You see mixed responses at 12 weeks and then, and then better responses at 18 weeks. But again, even with ipilimumab, most patients who are going to respond, you see something happening at 12 weeks, even if it's a mixed response. And when a patient fails this therapy, the anti-PD-1, what would be the, I think you mentioned the patient that um, she moved on to another course of therapy. What, what would she do next? Um, you know, it depends. So, if you it depends on the patient. So, for example, if you if you uh, I personally treat patients with immunotherapies first because um, I believe that immunotherapies are better able to give people durable remission. So, even patients who have BRAF mutations, I would probably offer an immunotherapy trial first. Um, so, if that patient has not yet received a BRAF inhibitor, they can go on to a, a, a BRAF inhibitor if they have the BRAF mutation. But there are many options. For example, uh, you could go on to get ipilimumab. I mean, mostly we would like to put people on a clinical trial so we could understand what that next therapy is going to do. But, but outside of a clinical study, there are a number of options. For patients who are eligible for interleukin-2, they could go on to interleukin-2. For patients that are eligible for uh, ipilimumab, they could go on to ipilimumab. For patients who are eligible for vemurafenib, they could get vemurafenib. Um, and there are some patients who can't get any of those things, and you might have to give palliative chemotherapy at that point. Some patients could be referred for cell therapies at other centers. So depending on the individual patient, what they've had before, the, their particular biology, there are a number of different options after anti-PD-1. In fact, even interferon may be interesting in that setting. Remember, the anti-PD-1 drug, once you get it, is in your body for a long time. It's in your body for several months. So whatever you give next, it's almost like giving combination therapy. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you give next may work better because the anti-PD-1 is on board. And what about the anti-PD-L? And how does that compare with the anti-PD-1? No one's seen the data. So I, I, at least no one that I know has seen the, the data in full. So. We don't know. My guess is that it would work just as well as anti-PD-1, but there are biological reasons to believe they might be different, so um, I, I, we just don't know. It's very early. Are there um, any phase one trials for that? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, MDX-1105 is in phase one trials. Okay. And um, one individual said that he was told his best chance was if they combined anti-PD-1 with your VOI and then anti-PDL, and he did all three at one time. What would you, you think can't. of that? <laughs> <laughs> you mean, there's no way they could have gotten all three drugs at the same time. I mean, you mean a patient was treated with all three drugs? No, no, it was suggested to him that that, that was a, an opti optimal therapy. <laughs> um, well, there, I believe that there was an, there, there was an animal model that was uh, published in which that triple combination looked better, so mm -hmm. giving all three looked better. Um, but whether that will be true in humans or not, we don't know. And we don't still don't know whether the combination of ipilimumab with anti-PD-1 is going to be the best combination. Right. There may be other combinations that are even more interesting and more exciting, even with older drugs, because, for example, I think the interferon anti-PD-1 combination will be very interesting. It turned out that interferon combined with Tremolimumab was a very interesting combination. That was a trial done by Dr. John Kirkwood. And it turned out that ipilimumab combined with bevacizumab also produced very interesting results. That was a trial done by Dr. Steve Hody at the Dana-Farber. So mm -hmm. I think we, we need to reserve judgment and do all these combinations and then figure out which one is going to be best. Remember, when you combine this drug with other drugs, you might also increase toxicity. So well, that's, you have yeah. to... Yeah, it'll be a balance of activity and toxicity that determines the best combination. You know, that, that's the first thing I think of when you say interferon is introducing toxicity then. Well, y y it does, but, um, y you know, again, it depends on the dose of interferon, it depends on how you give it, and the duration that you give it. So 
I wouldn't be afraid of an interferon combination uh, necessarily because of the inherent toxicities of interferon by itself. Okay. And do you have any idea of um, how this is moving throughout the world, um, how availability in Europe or other nations? Um, I, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm a single clinical investigator in a multi-center trial. Um, and um, you, the, the, you know, these decisions are made um, um, you know, at the level of the sponsor. So um, no, I don't know what's been done um, around the world. I do know of other companies that have these drugs. I, I mentioned those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of those other companies, like for example, CureTech, initially wasn't interested in solid tumors. They developed their anti-PD-1 and hematologic malignancies, hmm. but they are, uh, they are now going to move into, my understanding is, into melanoma. So mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll see. And, and we don't know that all these agents are going to behave the same way in patients, right? So that's another question that remains to be answered. Right, the diff different molecules can all be different. That, that's correct, yeah. OK. And is this moving? How fast in the U.S.? I mean, how long will it be before we? I mean, it seems like the other drugs have moved pretty quickly through the FDA recently. How quickly you, is is this moving along? You know, I I, I can't answer that question. I mean, um, you, you, you know, I don't know how the FDA will respond to these kinds of data. I, I mean, I myself am very excited about these data, and uh, um, I can tell you from an investigator standpoint that. We would all love to see uh, all attention be focused on this drug and for it to move really rapidly. But the reality is is that um, uh, you know from a sponsor point of view, they have many different drugs, many different priorities. and even e even for a drug like anti pd one, which is active in more than one disease, there may be different priorities for development. They, they may be more interested in another indication first. Mm -hmm. so um, and and you know there are un, they're not unlimited resources to do a clinical trial in every disease in every setting, so all we can hope for is that um, uh, uh, the different companies will understand the value of of and the importance of doing this in melanoma, which I think they do, and will move it as quickly as they possibly can. And I think they all have very good intentions to do so, but obviously uh, patients and and investigators are always going to be impatient because no matter how fast they move, we'll always say they need to move faster. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, I saw in your data there was a colorectal patient, I believe, that had a complete response. And yeah. It, I, uh, it, 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 well, that was that's the, the data from the first phase one trial. That was right. from Julie Bramer's trial. So I, I wondered, well, if that moved quicker in that disease group, I mean, we would still benefit possibly, you know, with the, um, if it was approved, we could always do it off-label, or if that was a way of maneuvering it quicker to market. Well, actually, no. These no. days, these days, if you don't have FDA approval, you don't get insurance reimbursement. Right. So, if it's not doesn't have an indication, even if you know it's active, um, it, you know, insurance companies aren't obligated to pay for the drug and these drugs are going to be very expensive. So getting that FDA indication is really very important for patients. Right. I realize that it's just daydreaming about how we might move it on. <laughs> but, but having it on the market is good because often the data required for a secondary indication isn't as stringent as the data required for an initial indication. So it may be faster to develop it in a specific disease once the drug is approved for us, the first indication. Hmm. That, that would be very interesting. Well, I certainly appreciate your time tonight sharing all of your information with us. I, I apologize for calling you the pioneer, but I meant <laughs> clinically. Clinically, <laughs> you're a pioneer with this. And uh, oh. uh, I hope you'll, you'll join us again and, and do another webinar with us. But Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.